Atrena Dhamudar Prasidati Namo Mahavarannaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namne Gaudatise Namaha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Brindavanishwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye <coughs> Tave Vasmi, Tave Vasmi, Najivami, Tayavinai, Tivigaya, Radhe, Tvam Nayamam, Charanantike. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Garadhar, Shiva Shri Gaura Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <coughs> First of all, I offer my obeisances countless times to my most worshipful Guru Pada Padma, Param Aradita Mastotar, Sri Srimad Bhaktivedanta Narayanga Swami Maharaj Shri Gurudev, likewise, and to the entire Rupa Nuga Gaudiya Guru Varga and all assembled devotees, please accept my Dandavat pranams. Today is the very wonderful occasion of the appearance of Srila Bhaktivedanta Trivikram Goswami Maharaj, our Abhina Guru Pada Padma. We've heard many times from the devotees, from the Vaishnavas, that Srila Bhaktivedanta Trivikram Goswami Maharaj, Srila Bhaktivedanta Vami Goswami Maharaj, and our beloved Srila Gurudev are all inseparable, like three bodies and one Atma, three, one soul. So therefore we consider him to be our non-different Guru Bada Padma. He was such an exalted Vaishnav, he was so... His kinchen a kinchen, he never accepted disciples. But the whole world is the disciples of such an exalted personality, such a Mahabhagavat as he is. So we'll hear some of his glories <coughs> that have been spoken by his various sevaks. We were with Proji and we were traveling, I think, in. Uh, in, far down in Bengal towards the ocean <clears throat> once and we met some of his sevaks there who were with him before and they told some of his childhood stories that they had heard from the family members. Also, Brody was with him for a long time so he heard many stories of his life from him directly just like Shilavama Goswami Maharaj told of his life stories to Prabhuji when he was sick and Prabhuji was serving him in Calcutta. Also, Srila Gurudev told many of his life stories to Prabhuji when he would come to the Devananda Gaudiya Mat when he was a young boy after school. So Prabhuji heard many of these stories directly from these Acharyas. And these are very sweet pastimes that these are not the sort of pastimes that are always spoken in public by the Acharyas themselves. They are told to their intimate sevaks and then later the sevaks reveal them by their mercy to the devotees. <coughs> Some of these stories are known by the devotees, because they witness them directly on Brijmandal Parikrama. They witness the sweet exchanges of Srila Trivikram Goswami Maharaj with Srila Gurudev many times. And some of the earlier stories were witnessed directly by the Vaishnavas who were in their presence from the 70s. <coughs> or were told by Gurudev from the 50s, 60s. Or by Param Gurudev Sevaks, or Bhaktisiddhanta Prabhupada's disciples as well. So we know that he was born, before he was born, we hear from the Vaishnavas that his grandparents would come every year to Brindavan Daham, to Braj Mandal. And at that point, their children, their sons, didn't have any children. So they were praying that they would have a son. They didn't have a son at that point. <clears throat> I think one son had been lost in a childbirth. And so they were praying, I'm pretty sure. So they were praying for a healthy young son, strong son. So they heard the glories of Shmati Radharani and at Barshana, if you go and pray for her mercy there, then she will give her blessings. Barashana means, Barsha is rain, and Ana means to come, Barashana, for rain to come. But which rain? The, the rain of Radharani's mercy, Barashana, Radharani's Barshana. So they prayed there for the rain of Radharani's mercy to come upon them. And they said, if you give our family a good son, they were the grandparents, if you give our children a good son, healthy son, then we'll offer him in your service. <clears throat> it 
said that they were very wealthy landowners. So they would donate hundreds of kilos of ghee. Because in temples like Barshana, in Jagannath Puri, all around India, they have lamps where they are burning ghee lamps 24 hours a day throughout the whole year. So it takes around 15 kilos of ghee a month, I believe. That's a low estimate. So they would donate all the ghee for Barshana Temple. And they prayed to Radharani, please give us a son. And it said that, they said, we will offer him in your service. <clears throat> so Radharani, who will she accept into her service? Only her own maidservants, her own kinkaris can serve her directly. So she thought, better I send my own kinkari, my own associate, my own maidservant. So therefore she sent Shri Sri Rukram Goswami Maharaj. And when he was born, he was given the name Radhanath, whose, whose worshipful deity is Shimati Radharani. So it said that you can understand someone's coming nature, hote hoi chikne pat, by there's some indications at birth or when they're growing up. It's also described like, um, what's the example? That this, yeah, the, the, in Hindi we say, hon har virvan hote hai chikne pat, like a small tree, a small sprout, when it starts growing up, if it has big, strong, bright, vibrant leaves, you know it's going to be a strong, powerful tree. So same way, hon har virvan, if someone's going to be very powerful and mighty, you can understand from their birth and before. What time do you get in, Shravan? What time did you get in? <clears throat> so Giri Prabhu is on Bhiksha today, and at the arrival of Shravan Prabhu, we Prabhu hopefully will be again speaking tonight. We've been hearing the rumors since many days. So uh, we'll continue from what we heard from Shri from Prabhuji. So it said that Shri Jirakam Goswami Maharaj, he had this name, Radnath, from childhood. Um, from one of his sevaks, I forget the Maharaj's names. Um, we heard this one from, from, we were hearing his, we sat down with him for about two, three hours with Prabhuji to hear the life stories of Shri Jirakam Goswami Maharaj because he was with him for like 30, 40 years. Puri Maharaj, I think. I think Bhaktivedanta Puri Maharaj, Bengali Sanyasi, who was Jirukam Goswami Maharaj Sevak. So he said when he went to school, <coughs> he was very, um, not naughty, but he was very like strong, you know, in whatever his ideas were. And it said that he had different teachers in his school, but he didn't really like his um, Sanskrit teacher. He said his Sanskrit teacher was, there's one kind of like pundit, you know, Smartha pundit, where they only are focused on like the external grammar or rhetoric, but they don't focus on the essence of Krishna Prem, Krishna Bhakti. They miss the essence of the Sastras. There's a story about a Sanskrit pundit that once he was going <clears throat> through village to village, like as a teacher, and in one village they told him, oh, you shouldn't cross through this jungle in, in the evening time, that there are many tigers that will eat you. He said, tiger, no problem, I'm such a great Sanskrit grammarian and pundit that the tigers will also be my disciples. And he said, don't, don't think like that, you know. But he was very obstinate and he said, tiger means to, uh, there's a Sanskrit uh, verb that means to eat, but it also means to smell. He said, no problem, they will not eat me, they'll just come and smell me and I'll teach it grammar and all these things myself. So he went through the jungle and the tiger ate him. So he said, these kinds of pundits who only are focused on the external, ultimately, Time, or the snake or the serpent of time will devour them, and what will happen like that? So anyhow, <clears throat> Trivikram Goswami Maharaj's teacher, like the Sanskrit professor, he was always like dressed up as a big pundit, you know, like they have big sikas, the shaved head, sika cuffs are like 60% of your head, <laughs> a big long sika, and like wear the Tripundra Tilak, and like the Rudraksha, and the Malas, you know, they look like the pundit professors. So Trivikram Goswami Maharaj would like be a little bit uh, not focused in the classes and he would sometimes joke with the other boys. And so this professor was, would get very upset, you know, why are you paying attention to the classes? Why are you not focused? So one day he talked with the other boys and they made a plan that they all shaved their heads and kept this big sita, big so choti, like 60% of their head. 
and they dress just like the professor, you know, <laughs> the big beads, you know, the cloth like a pundit, you know, and they went and they sat in class. And when he arrived, he saw them all, his mirror image, just his little boys, and immediately he was like disturbed. And then he tried to ignore it and continue the classes. So then he was speaking the class, and today they were all very enthusiastic. And whatever he was saying, ka, ka, ga, ga, all these different Sanskrit, then they were all like loudly saying this as well. And then Sri Prabhupada had arranged that he said that they were all like, because sometimes the pundit, when he would give lectures, he would kind of like get really focused and start shaking his head when he was speaking. So they would also start shaking and twirling their sikas around in the air like this, like 30, 40 boys. <laughs> and then the pundit got very upset and called the principal. And the principal came to the class and he saw all the boys like this and the principal also started laughing. <laughs> so he, the principal could not stop himself. And afterwards he said, look, you should not. You should not neglect these classes, it's also important. And he said, he's only speaking about external things. Why isn't he talking about the real essence? It said Param Gurudev was like that. When Param Gurudev went to his university in Calcutta, then he would challenge the professor's Mayavad commentary of Chitan Charitamrita. They would speak these verses that the Jiva is non-different from Krishna. They would try to establish Mayavad on the basis of Chitan Charitamrita. And Param Gurudev would challenge them and cut their, their ideas. So it said also that Sri Rukam Goswami is like this. We see this also in the life of our different acharyas, like Ramanuja Acharya. When Yadav Prakash was speaking about, in a very offensive way, about the Lord, then he immediately challenged him and cut his ideas. So the acharyas cannot tolerate any aparad or any offense to their Ishta Devs. So Sri Rukam Goswami Maharaj had many sweet pastimes. said that when the Vaishnavas were preaching, Narutamananda Prabhu was preaching after Bhaktisanta Prabhupada left and Param Gurudev established the Godi Vedanta Smriti. And then Narutamananda Prabhu, who was also Prabhupada's disciple, was with Param Gurudev and preaching as well, especially in these areas like East Bengal, also Bihar, where he met Srila Gurudev later. So he went to the area where Sri Prabhupada Goswami was at that time, I think in college or maybe late high school, and he preached at the school there. Rudy describes a very sweet exchange between them. And Trivikram Goswami was always very strong and bold, so he challenged this Nartama Nanda Prabhu and was debating with him about the nature of the Atma, the purpose of life, the meaning of life, all these things. But he was very attracted by the message because his family were actually following the Ramakrishna mission, which the Gaudiya Mat people would call the Murgi mission, the chicken mission. Because in the Ramakrishna mission, they talk about serving everyone, talk about everyone being God, but then they say they all eat chicken and goat and fish and they're dressed as sannyasis. So the Gaudiya Mahat say they're great pretenders and cheaters. They neglect the Atma, the soul, they neglect everything essential and they're only focused on the external and they say uh, Daridra Narayan, the poor man is God. And they say we serve the poor man by feeding them goat, fish, chicken, subsidizing all these things. And so Vaishnavas would be very upset with this. Bhakti Santa Prabhupada said, better than opening such kinds of charity centers is to open the real Gaudiya hospital where the living entities can be given atma, like bal, food for the soul, and awaken into their true identities. So he preached against the Ramakrishna mission, and Sri Rukam Goswami Maharaj liked it because he didn't so much like the sadhus from the Ramakrishna mission. He thought they were hypocrites. They're preaching all these big things, but they themselves don't have any good etiquette, sadhachar. So he, Sri Rukam Goswami Maharaj spoke with him for a long time, a few hours, and he became very impressed and happy and he wanted to give a big donation because they were preaching and traveling, collecting for the Navadhi Dham Parikrama that Param Gurudev had established again, where thousands and thousands of people would attend. So he asked, how can I serve? And Narthaman Anandapu said, oh, you can collect rice, you can give rice, dal, potato, pumpkin, all these different vegetables. And <clears throat> so therefore, he went back home and he told his parents that I'm going to give donations to these people. And they thought, who is it? Ramakrishna Mission Sadhus. Because they're always giving donations of money and food and things like that to the Ramakrishna Mission. But when they heard it was the Gaudiya Mat, they became very angry. The Gaudiya Mat, useless Babaji's, all they do is dance and sing around like madmen. They never serve the public. They never engage in social work. We can read in the biographies of different, like the Ramakrishna Mission Sadhus, also the... Um, I think Aurobinda, not Aurobinda, um, 
Vivekananda, and also, no, there's another more recent one, Autobiography of a Yogi that's famous in the West. Forget his name? Yeah, so he talks about it. Oh, we go, whenever they talk about the Gaudiya Mat, they just laugh and joke about it. Oh, they're just dancing around like madmen. They don't study the Vedanta. They don't, you know, even though they don't know what is the real essence of the Vedanta, they, the sadhus, Gaudiya Mat devotees know everything. But they'll criticize them. Oh, they're just useless Babaji's. And also before Bhakti Nur Thakur, the Gaudiya Vaishnavas did have a bad reputation for engaging in like low class activities. So it said that he told this to his parents and his parents had, like refused to give anything. And he was saying, before you said like, I'm the elder son, everything is for me. But now you're not letting me even do anything according to my own desire. So he thought I will go and give, he had a bank account in his name, he thought I'll go and give some donation from my own account. So it said that the parents called the bank and in advance and told him don't give anything. So he was very, at that point, it was the first time he tasted some bitterness for family life. He became a little bit displeased with them, seeing that, oh, actually they're just selfish. That if it's not favorable to their own desires, then, oh, who is the son, who is the father, who is, what is our relationship? Ultimately, it is all based on selfishness. The Upanishads say like that. The father does not love the son for the sake of the son, only for the sake of himself. The husband does not love the wife for the sake of the wife, only for himself. This is the nature of samsara, family life. It's all based on selfishness. So Tripa Kanga Swami Maharaj became a little disturbed and he told the sadhus that I can't give anything now, but I'll come soon and I'll bring so much and I'll give it to the mat and I won't let them stop me. So anyhow he arranged and he came some months later and brought many things to the mat for the service of the Vaishnavas. But his family found out where he was going, where he went, and they came after him. And so he had stayed there for some time and he became very attracted to Param Gurudev and he wanted to join the Mat at that point. But his family came and they, he was thinking of joining the Mat because he was disturbed with his family already. They had disturbed him and stopped his service. So he was thinking of joining the Mat. But then his family came and pretty said like in India, especially when a son wants to leave home, the family members make it very difficult. We see with Raghunath Das Goswami. We see with Srila Gurudev. We see with the father of Srila Vaman Goswami Maharaj. Their family members generally make it very difficult to join and become a sadhu. So with Sri Chivakram Goswami Maharaj, <clears throat> the family members came with all the other villagers and they surrounded the mat. And they say, we're going to lay siege upon the mat until you give our son back. So anyhow, Param Guru, they said, okay, go back now again, don't worry. No one can stop, stop destiny, but let's kind of diffuse the situation now and you can go home. So he went home and then they thought, okay, we need to give him an attractive wife. This is the same philosophy that they tried to use with Raghunath Das Goswami, but it didn't work for him. So how would it work for Radharani's dear Sevak, Shri Chirukam Goswami Maharaj Radhanath? They gave him, got him married to a very beautiful young girl. And, but he still did not have any desire to stay there. He had no desire. He was completely detached at that point. So they saw him again and again wanting to leave. So they ended up trying to keep him locked up in his house. Pretty describes this. And so he, one time, how he escaped, Puruti describes that in the rainy season, he was locked up in a room and they're always like staying very closely, like vigilant to make sure he didn't escape. So one time they, he, he started bribing this, um, like the sweeper cleaner lady and he exchanged cloth with her, <laughs> took her broom, took her bucket, put on a wig and dressed up as like a lady. And when it was a stormy day, it was very rainy. And just like when Krishna had to leave Mathura, you know, then all the guards, everyone fell asleep. So Trivikram Goswami Maharaj, when he was ready to leave, then it's like monsoon, rainy season, everyone had left down their guard a little bit, thinking he's not going to escape in the middle of a huge storm, with a huge monsoon. If you see the monsoon in Bengal, it's like, it's like a hurricane mixed with, a, you know, the downpour that looks like Pralaya is coming, you know. So at that time, he exchanged cloth with this sweeper lady, dressed up like a sweeper lady himself, and snuck out of the house, and it said then he walked like 20, 30 kilometers through the rice fields in the pouring rain to get to a station. And then from there he got to the station and he went to Devananda Gaudiya Mat. And he surrendered to Param Gurudev there saying, please now accept me, I never want to leave. So Param Gurudev was accepted him, but the family found out again, obviously they knew he would go back there if he escaped. So they came again and they brought his wife and they placed her in the mat. And he said, now you're married, how can you leave your young wife? How can you leave your young wife? So they kept her there, and they were also staying for some days. They said, you must come back, and they left the wife there. And she was staying outside his room for many days. 
And he said when he would leave to go to the bathroom or anything, she would sneak into the room and like hide under his bed or something. She was very obstinate like that. He said, <laughs> Sangsadic people are like that. It said like if there's many crabs in a bucket and one like in a, and there's a net over them and they've caught many crabs and one crab is escaping and just about to get outside the net. Then the other crabs below grab onto their legs and pull them back down. <laughs> They're very envious like that. So if one person is trying to escape sangsar, material family life, and serve Krishna, then the other family members will try to pull their legs down, try to pull them back down and keep them in family life. And it said that family where a Vaishnava has been born and is going to serve Krishna is the most fortunate family. They're the most blessed. And real Vaishnava family members will be very happy when someone from their family, whether a boy or girl, goes to serve Krishna. We see Mirabai was a princess, but her family tried to poison her and even kill her rather than letting her go and serve Krishna. But on the other hand, real Vaishnavs will be like Bhama Goswami Maharaj's mother. She was very happy that her son was joining the Mat and serving the Mat. She was very happy. So that is like an example of a real mother. So Sri Trivikram Goswami Maharaj, then his wife was staying there, but she was not ready to go. So then it said what happened there that Finally, she was again and again telling him, oh, if you don't accept me, I'll kill myself. If you don't accept me, I'll kill myself. We'd hear this every Kartik with Gurudev. If you don't accept me, I'll kill myself. And he was like, I don't care. What do I care? So she said again, well, if you don't accept me, I'll kill myself. So he said, no problem. If you have the kerosene, I have the matches. No problem. She was saying, I'll pour kerosene over myself and light myself on fire in the middle of the temple. And everyone will come from all around and they'll shut down the mat. They'll be very upset. He said, no problem. You have the kerosene, I have the matches. <laughs> so he was completely detached. So finally, her fam she was fasting. Finally, her family took her back home. And at that point, um, they took her back home. And uh, after she was fasting. And after a short time, after some weeks, some months, she gave up her body. So is this cruelty? Was he cruel? <laughs> we can, from an ordinary material perspective, people think, oh, this was cruel. But the real cruelty is to said pitana sasyad swadanona sat sat that a father is not a father or mother is not a mother a husband is not a husband a wife is not a wife guru is not a guru if they cannot help liberate you from samsara material life they are not a real relative their only real relation is between atma and guru atma and real vaishnavas atma and your eternal associates in the spiritual world and your swarup deha they are your real relatives and friends everything else is just like when you board a train, you'll stay in one coach, like eight seats in Indian trains. And seven, if you're going alone, then seven other people will fill up the other seats of the train, the other berths. And you'll stay with them for some hours, some stops. Some stops will go by and other people will be coming and going. And eventually, you'll have to go separate ways. This is the nature of time. These material relations we have are like people who are traveling with us on the same coach in a train. But ultimately, we have to separate. It said people come together like straws of grass in the ocean or in the river when the different waves push them together. And then again, when the waves go out, then they're separated. So we should not be attached to these material relationships because ultimately they are temporary. And the only way to really help someone is to give them Krishna Upadesh and this Krishna Bhakti Beach. So bring them to the shelter of Guru and Vaishnavas. Actually, this girl was very fortunate to have come to the Dham to have stayed in the mat, to have heard kirtan, to have taken prasad sometimes. And then afterwards, definitely she got a higher birth. So there's no cruelty on his part. So then what happened? He said, after he joined the mat, he was very responsible, very duteous. Param Gurudev had great affection for him from the first time he met him. Because also it said that Param Gurudev... So when you come to the mud, according to the age you are in the mud, it's kind of like you stay to a certain degree in that age. Or the Vaishnavas perceive you like that. So Sajan Sevak was very young when he joined the mud, like eight years old, seven, eight. And he was coming from the city, he was a boy. So Param Gurudev saw him like a young boy. And Srila Gurudev came later, but Srila Kamgoswami Maharaj came next. And he came as like a strong man. You know, it's like in his, I think, early 20s. And he was very responsible, very intelligent, always taking care of all different like necessities in the mat. So Parmgurde was very uh, affectionate to him and he would give him lots of responsibilities. I said after some time after he had joined, then Parmgurde called Sajan Sevak and said, now bring a registry, make a register. Because at Gaur Purnima, he gave him initiation and in Diksha and he gave him the name like Radnath Brahmachari. 
And so he said, bring a register. And now I want you to write like for maintaining all my disciples so I know who is who and when people came. So he said, in the top, you should write the Radnatas Brahmachari, number one. <laughs> so hearing that, Sajan Sevak, instead of fulfilling the order of his Gurudev, he went and hid in his room. And he didn't come out for a long time. And Param Gurudev said, he, didn't, he never came back. I gave him this instruction. He said, Guru Agya Hoya Vicharani, you should never disobey the order of your Guru. But he had so much mamata for Param Gurudev, he was thinking, oh, how can I accept this order? So Param Gurudev later called him and he saw he was like weeping, his you know, like red eyes, you know, tear stained. He said, why are you upset? Why are you crying? He said, oh, <clears throat> you have not accepted me as your own. You don't have mamata for me. You have not accepted me as your own. He said, no, you are Prabhupada's disciple. He was the Harinam disciple of Prabhupada. But Bhama Goswami's mood was that I am only yours. Even though he was also the disciple of Prabhupada, but he had not received diksha. Prabhupada had told him many times that I'll give you diksha after you finish school. But before he finished his school in the Bhaktivinoda Institute, then Prabhupada left this world, entered Nitya Lila. So he was thinking, oh, what can I do? <clears throat> so therefore, <clears throat> he had not received diksha, and later he received diksha when Param Gurudev was in the prison through the bars. Prabhupada himself came and said, give him diksha. And we were talking the other day about the importance of diksha, that if diksha weren't important, why would Prabhupada had come and said to Param Gurudev, give him diksha even when he was in prison? And why would the Vaishnavas not accept water or food touched by his hand if Diksha were not important? Some people say Diksha is not important, but Diksha shows relationship, like family relationship and spiritual life. Now you have a spiritual mother, a spiritual father. Once you have Diksha, then you can get Shiksha Guru also. But first it said Krishna Dikshari Shikshanam. First you get Krishna Diksha and Shiksha. And Gurudev said when he de defined what is a Vaishnava, he said, Grihita Vishnu Dikshako Vishnu Puja Paronara Vaishnava Bihito Bigirita Rusmad Avaishnava. That know that a Vaishnav is someone who is initiated in the Vishnu Diksha mantra and worshipping Lord Vishnu or Krishna. That is a Vaishnav. Otherwise, one is not a Vaishnav. And when you receive Diksha mantras, then we receive Gayatri mantra and then Acharya is Pita, Gayatri is Matra. Acharya is your father and Gayatri is your mother. And then you enter your spiritual family and start to meet all your spiritual family members. And then you can get a spiritual teacher like a Shiksha Guru. So Diksha is very important. And Param Gurudev had given this first initiation of Diksha to Srila Trivikram Goswami Maharaj, Radhanath Brahmachari. So he was saying, put him first in the registry. At that time, Vama Goswami Maharaj felt some like sadness that, oh, he has not accepted me. Even though he gave me Diksha, he's not putting me there. He said, no, you're Prabhupada's disciple. He, Param Gurudev didn't like own, have ownership towards him because he is Guru's property. How can I enjoy Guru's property? But Bhama Goswami said, you are non-different from Prabhupada and Prabhupada told you to give me Diksha, so you are my Diksha Guru. So finally Param Gurudev relented and said, okay, first you write Sajan Sevak Brahmachari, then you can write Radnath Brahmachari. And then they were very happy. <laughs> he wasn't upset that, oh, I don't, I'm not getting the top position. He wasn't upset over position. Mundane people, they think, oh, I should be number one. But his only mood was that, oh, I'm not there. If, he, if they had said Radhanath Brahmachai one, then Sajan Sevak two. But he just said Radhanath Brahmachai. He wasn't saying to put Sajan Sevak on the list because he thought he was Prabhupada's disciple. So therefore, Sajan Sevak did like a fast, a strike, until he was added to the list. And then Param Gurudev accepted. So then they began, they were serving Prabhupada, Param Gurudev, serving all the Vaishnavas, many elderly Vaishnavas who were disciples of Bhaktisanta Prabhupada were also there. They served everyone. Then they started going uh, preaching with Param Gurudev. They would preach here and there. And sometimes Param Gurudev would send them preaching with Narutam Ananda Prabhu. So it said when Narutam Ananda Prabhu was preaching in Bihar, and where he met Srila Gurudev in Buksar, that time Radhanath Brahmachai was there. So Srila Gurudev met them there. And immediately Gurudev developed friendship with them. And soon after that, Gurudev also joined the Mat. And I said, when Gurudev joined the Mat, Srila Trivikram uh, Goswami Maharaj and Gurudev immediately had a very strong friendship. But it was such a close friendship, like between brothers, that sometimes brothers will quarrel and fight and wrestle, but then they'll eat together off the same plate. Like very close brothers. So then it said that Srila Gurudev and Trivikram Goswami Maharaj, sometimes they would argue with each other. And like the argument would reach such a pitch, they would be shouting at each other and about to fight each other. And then they would ultimately go to Sajan Sevak, Brahmachari, and he would reconcile any of their arguments. And they would sit down together and they would take prasad together on the same plate. <laughs> they had a very close friendship like that. Sajan Sevak, uh, Vama Goswami was more mild-mannered. But Gurudev was also very powerful, very strong, very bold, and Trivikram Goswami was also like that. So when they would argue with each other, it would be like two bulls fighting, you know? But afterwards, they would sit together and eat together very lovingly. 
So therefore, at that time, then they began serving in the mat. And they served so much together. Um, so they, they said that they would all preach together at different places with Param Gurudev. Param Gurudev, Chirvakam Gustav Maharaj, Satan Sevak, uh, the Gurudev. They would preach together with Param Gurudev in different places. Sometimes some would go with Nartama Nanda Prabhu, and some would go with Param Gurudev. This is like still in the late 40s, late 40s and early 50s. They would preach together. Later on, they took sannyas, and sometimes after sannyas, they would also preach together. But more after sannyas, Param Gurudev sent them to preach more like separately, to spread the mission. So it said once, Param Gurudev, they were traveling in the villages of Bengal, and Gurudev Seva was to take the projector. They would preach to the villagers with a projector, and they would put pictures of Mahaprabhu, Radha Krishna, and they would put up like slides, bhakti points. You know, they would use this kind of projector system. It's interesting because. Like even at that time, they were using kind of these systems to attract the people towards Krishna. So one time, Gurudev forgot the projector. When, when you're on Bengal Prachar, every day you're visiting like three or four villages or like two or three programs, and it's a very strenuous program. And that time, you know, there wasn't buses and autos from one place to another. They would have to walk from one village to another or take some bullet cart or horse cart. And they were very far away, and it was very difficult to go from one place to another. So one time, Gurudev forgot it, and he told... Trivikram Goswami said, oh no, I forgot it. At night time, the program's coming. You know, and Param Gurudev, it was the first time, so Param Gurudev was going to chastise him. He was very afraid. He was thinking, what to do? So Trivikram Goswami said, don't worry, I'll figure it out. I'll work it, I'll work it out. So then at like four or five in the afternoon, like an hour, the class the program was starting, Kirtan was starting. He told Param Gurudev, oh, I heard that there's going to be a, there might be some rainstorm. It's a high probability of rain. <laughs> so if we bring out the projector tonight, then it may become wet and broken. It's very expensive. So Param Gurudev had such great like, faith in the responsibility of Trivikram Goswami. He said, yes, no problem. Today we'll just have simple kirtan, harikata, and then quickly go. So they did a quick program and then left. So in this way he saved Srila Gurudev from any chastisement. Seeing like even how close was their friendship that he did like this. So then how did they take sannyas? After they preached for a few years, then Param Gurudev called them together and he said, now I want you to take sannyas. At that point, they were still like in their early 30s, right? Gurudev was born in 21, so Gurudev was like, this was 52. And later Gurudev went to, uh, started staying in Keshwaji Gaudiamat in 54. So Gurudev was like 31 years old. Chirugam Goswami was born in 1916 or 15, 16, I think. So he was a little bit older. He was the eldest of them. And... Vamagustha well, Maharaj was born, I think, the same year as Gurudev, right? So I think he was the same age. So Trivikram Goswami Maharaj was the eldest. So Param Gurudev told them to take sannyas. <clears throat> and first he told Vamagustha Maharaj, Sajjan Sevak, he said, no, 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 how can I take sannyas? There's so many elevated disciples of Prabhupada who are sannyasis, you're sannyasi, I don't want to be on the equal level with you. Also Trivikram Goswami Maharaj declined. He said, no, I don't want to take sannyas. How can I take sannyas? I don't want to put myself in equal position with the disciples of Prabhupada. He said, no, this is necessary for preaching. You should accept this responsibility. But they were very hesitant. So then he asked Gurudev, and Gurudev said, like very quickly, he just he said, I don't, I'm completely yours. I've completely surrendered myself to you. I've given up all relation to family, mother, father, brother, sister. I have no relation to anyone in my family. I'm completely, 100% offered myself to you. Whether you want to put me in black cloth or white cloth or red cloth or make me naked wandering around in the street, I'm yours and yours alone. So Param Gurudev was very happy. And then he called Sajjan Sevak and Radhanath. He said, look, Gornarayan is going to take sannyas. And then he is your junior god brother. And you all have to offer pranam to him. And you have to accept him as your senior, even though he is junior. So will you not take sannyas? And then smiling and joking, understanding the desire of Param, Param Gurudev, they also accepted and took sannyas. So at that point, all three took sannyas together. And shortly after that, then Param Gurudev told them, now I want you to start preaching in different places. Sometimes we'll preach together, but mostly he wanted them to preach in different places. And that was one of the reasons, reasons they didn't want to take sannyas. Sajjan Sevak and Radhanath Brahmacharya said, no, we don't want to leave you. If we take sannyas, we'll make us preach here and there. We always want to be with you. Sajjan Sevak was like Sevak of Param Gurudev. Chirukam Goswami Maharaj was also serving him closely, directly. He said, real Guru Seva does not just mean to massage the feet and wash the clothes. Real Guru Seva means to fulfill the desire of Guru Maharaj, whatever he wants, Prithividan. Please and serve and fulfill his desire. That is real Guru Seva, not just washing clothes, cooking for him, massaging his feet. He said, if you go, many new boys will come. If you're always with me, he said, Puri sometimes says, you have to get rid of the old buffaloes so new buffaloes can come. <laughs> 
So if you don't go, then no new brahmacharis will come. You're taking up all the sevas, all the personal sevas, and how will other people mature and advance and if they don't get some chance to build Sukriti by serving directly. So he said, you should go and preach. And they were very hesitant, but finally they went and started preaching. And Srila Gurudev, we know how, Srila Gurudev went with Param Gurudev on Braj Mandal Parikrama and they established this Keshuji Gaudiyamat. Before it was called the Grid Das Dharmashala. There's a long history about that. Um, we won't get into that. That's also in Sri Guru Darshan. So Sri Rukam Goswami, he started preaching in, mostly he was preaching here and there, but his base was in Udharan Gaudiya Mat in Chunchura. That was like the first Mat. That was actually where Uma Didi was, uh, her father had given that land. They were wealthy at that time. She had given that land and there was the Gornitan and the Didis there and they were serving there. So Sri Rukam Goswami served there and We'll just skip ahead quickly through the pastimes so we can tell a few more of the later pastimes. So Param Gurudev, they preached for many years there under Param Gurudev's direct guidance. And Param Gurudev was very happy with them. There were many sweet pastimes how they preached together. Finally, Param Gurudev entered Nitya Lila in 1968 and Sadat Purnima. And at that time, it said they already had a, actually a close connection with Swami Prabhupada. That Swami Prabhupada was one of the a core members of the Vedanta Samiti, one of the four starting members, founding members. At that point he was Abhai Charanada Vinda Bhakti Vedanta Prabhu. So he was one of the founding members. And when Param Gurudev left, then they sent a telegram to him. He was in Seattle. Prabhupada was in Seattle. And Sri Bhagavan Goswami sent this telegram. And Param Prabhupada immediately, the disciples of Prabhupada noted that he was very sober at that time in class. And he was weeping in class. And then he announced to them all that, oh, my very dear, very dear God brother and my sannyas guru has entered Nitya and we should all write a letter of condolence to that Vedanta Smriti and all the disciples there. So they sat down and he wrote a letter and he wrote this verse also, Vairagya Bhakti Rasam that He prayed to Param Gurudev just like Raghunath Das Goswami prayed to Sanatan Goswami. He said, I did not want to take this position of sannyas but he forcibly gave me and now by his mercy I'm preaching everywhere. So he wrote a letter and he had all the disciples sign it there, everyone who was there in Seattle at the time, and he sent it. And he also wrote a letter to Srila Srivakram Goswami Maharaj because they were also close. And he wrote his condolence to him. And at that time, he said also that I want pictures of Param Gurudev in all my temples. But this instruction was not obeyed. He actually requested pictures from Srivakram Goswami Maharaj and them, but they were, it did not arrive or they were not able to send and anyhow, it did not happen by Krishna's will. But he had said at that time, I want pictures of Param Gurudev in all the temples of Iskon. We can imagine what difference there would have been between the relationship between Iskon and the Gaudiya Mat if this instruction had been followed. Because Prabhupada had said that you should not associate with everyone from all the Gaudiya Mats. Because many different Vaishnavas, some of them were quite... Like there were different moods or some also were not pure Vaishnavas, had some envy towards Prabhupada or describes like that. But we should not like throw all the eggs in one basket. He said like, not everyone is the same. So Param Gurudev had so much love for Prabhupada and was always encouraging Prabhupada. When Prabhupada came to Mayapur, came to Navadweep and met with him in Vedanta Samiti in uh, 67, I believe, or 68, 67, maybe in the middle of 68, before, a few months before Param Gurudev left. He met with Param Gurudev and Param Gurudev, he was thinking of starting a temple in Navadweep and Param Gurudev was the one who said, no, you should start in Mayapur. Because your temple will be world famous, everyone will come there. And if you start it in Navadip, then everyone will think Navadip is the birthplace of Mahaprabhu. Because everyone will be coming there, and actually people will think wherever the mass populace is going will think that is the most permanent place. So he said, please, you should start it in Mayapur, then everyone will go to Mayapur. And then Prabhupada accepted this request from his elder godbrother and Sanyas Guru, and he also was ready, and he said, yes, we will start this in Mayapur. So they had a close relationship. So after Param Gurudev left then, Param Gurudev, before he left, actually, he, it said by the Vaishnavas that he wanted them all to be like acharyas together. He said, you can all become initiating gurus, and you can preach in different areas of India, and you can preach like this. He said he wanted Trivikam Goswami Maharaj also, and Gurudev and, and Bhama Goswami Maharaj all to be acharya. He was thinking like that. He had suggested like that. But after he left, then no one wanted to take this position. It's like the contrary to... People who aren't like Vaishnavas like this, they, everyone wants to immediately jump for the high position. But they don't realize, you give, giving initiation is like taking the sins of all your disciples. Guru has to accept this. And can you digest that or absorb it or deflect it? 
They said, if you're not established in pure bhakti, then you take up all these sins and you become yourself very... It, it will lead you to a very degraded condition if you're not able to take on these sins. Divya jnanam todadyat kurya papa shishankshayam that through diksha you're given, you give divya jnan, divine knowledge. So on one hand, does Guru have the power to give divine knowledge? Knowledge of your surup, Krishna's nature, Radharani, and your relationship with Mahaprabhu and Radha Krishna. Does he have that power? And then does he have the power to take all your pop? Papa shankshayam, all your pop will be destroyed. Does Guru have that power? If he doesn't have that power, then why would they give diksha? So people who think, oh, I want to give diksha, I want to give diksha. First, you should come to that platform that you can take on this responsibility. Guru means gurutva, dayatva, and it means it's a very heavy burden. Are you able to take up that? So none of them wanted to take the position of Acharya, of the Vedanta Smriti, and they were all requesting one another. And at that point, for the disappearance of Param Gurudev, then Surup Siddhanti Maharaj, who was a very close godbrother of Param Gurudev, he came and he performed Samadhi, and he was also overseeing, along with those three, he was officiating the Samadhi, he was the priest, and they were also helping. And afterwards they had a Shabha, like a Viraha Shabha, for a few days. And it said after Parmeli left for a few days, no one was coming out of the rooms. Everyone was just weeping and weeping and weeping. So finally, after, and they were fasting. Finally, after like one day passed, two days passed, then they had this Viraha Shabha. And in that, Srup Siddhanti Maharaj instructed them and said, I will help. They prayed to him, please be like a godfather to our Samiti. They were asking him to be Acharya, but he said, no, 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 this is your Param Gurudev's desire, your Acharya Keshari's desire that you continue this mission. So they requested him, please always look after us, help us like a godfather. And he accepted this role. And then they were discussing who should take the position of being Guru. And they were all requesting Bhama Goswami Maharaj. They wanted him to be. And he was saying, no, no, you should be. But they all together requested him, saying, you came first, you are also disciple of Prabhupada, you are like Shruti Dad. He was like unparalleled pundit in the scholar in the Gaudiya Mat. He said he was described to be like the Gaudiya Shabd Kosh, the Gaudiya Dictionary. He knew everything, all the slokas, every reference, everything. And he was very qualified, very mild. Trivikam Goswami Maharaj said, if I am Acharya, then I have sometimes very harsh nature and everyone will flee. <laughs> I will not tolerate any like misconduct and I will chastise everyone and then they'll run away. But Ram Goswami Maharaj is very soft and mild manner and tolerant. He said, he's so tolerant and so humble that he can, in Kali Yuga especially, it's like Chanakya Pandit said, Lala ne bhavo dosha, stara ne bhavo guna, tasmat putrang, chasishyang cha, tadriyan natu lalayat. It's understood in the Vedas that if you always are fondling or being lenient with your children or your disciple, then they will, it will foster bad qualities. And if you are sometimes strict and chastised, it will foster good qualities. Tadriyan natu lalayat. Therefore, you should be strong and sometimes chastised, not always be lenient with them. But still, in Kali Yuga, it's very difficult for people to accept chastisement and discipline, even though Guru Karnadharam, Guru is Karnadhar, he who pulls the ear, is the captain. But still, it's difficult. So we see Guru and Vaishnavas, how like, sweet and soft and gentle they are with devotees, even when they are committing bad activities. Sometimes they will chastise, but mostly they give great love and affection. So at that point, Bhama Goswami Maharaj reluctantly took up this role of the Acharya, and they all preached together. But he said, look... I will not do anything without your desire. And if you aren't staying with me and aren't, he said, like, if you leave or if you're not staying with me and helping me and also taking, like, responsibility as, like, co-members, then I'll also give it up. He said, I will not accept this as Guru Seva unless my godbrothers are serving with me. And they became president, vice president, and secretary of the Vedanta Samiti. Bhagavan Goswami Maharaj was president, Gurudev was vice president, and Sri Chukam Goswami Maharaj was the secretary. But he said, if you leave me, then I'll also leave this post. And before he would ever give diksha, he would always request Gurudev or Trivikam Goswami. He said, I'm going to perform a very dangerous and sinful activity. Please, only with your permission will I do it each time. He would pray like this. And he would always send people after he would initiate them. He would send them to Srila Gurudev for training or also to Srila Trivikam Goswami for, for training. And we see it was like unparalleled in the history of the Gaudi Mat that three god brothers who are on like equal level at mostly under, that they were serving together with complete harmony with no dispute no conflict as like we say three bodies in one soul they were so close to one another it was unprecedented in history of, we see generally brothers when the king leaves then the brothers will fight to be the next king they don't want to serve together same thing when Maharaj the Maharaj the great king or the Acharya leaves then all the young sons 
will fight for the position. And we see this after Bhakti Sandha Prabhupada left. But in this case of the Gaudiya Vedanta Smriti, they served in complete, absolute harmony, with great love and attraction for one another. Always, every Gorpanima, they would come together and they would meet and have discussions. Whatever collections Tribhukam Goswami Maharaj would make, on Biksha, he would give to Vamagas Maharaj. Whatever collections Vamagas Maharaj would give, he would give to Gurudev. Gurudev would give to Tribhukam Maharaj. And ultimately, they would, it would be like a joke amongst them. You know? Any collection they would make, they would give to their godbrother. And finally, they would take it all together and give it to the treasurer of the Samiti. And then they would decide, okay, now we have this temple project. We can give some money for this temple project. Okay, now we have to do this festival, we'll give something for this festival. They were completely selfless in their service to Param Gurudev. And disciples can do this also if their only motivation or their only focus is on serving their beloved Guru Pada Padma, then there's no question of disharmony between them. If they give out this idea of ego of, of the Purush, like I am the master, I am the controller, if instead of having this mood, we're only serving together Guru Pada Padma, also if disciples think Gurudev has left, now I have to be Guru, then also they will, this will lead to conflict. If they realize Guru Pad Padma is eternal, just like Krishna is eternal, Mahaprabhu is eternal. We cannot see Mahaprabhu externally, but he's here in our Murti form. So if we don't have faith, Mahaprabhu is here, then in front of Mahaprabhu we'll fight. Similarly, Guru Pad Padma is here in his Murti form. If we don't have faith in that, Murti form, Bapu, Murti form, then we'll fight in front of him. But if we believe, oh, Gurudev is present in this temple now, then how will we fight? Gurudev is in charge, Gurudev is the controller. Even if we fight, we'll go before Gurudev, and Gurudev will reconcile all problems. If we don't have this, if we feel like I am now a free and independent bull, and we'll fight with many other bulls. But now the master is here, then there's no reason to fight. Guru Maharaj is still here, and I'm only his das. Even though they have to take up the role, Acharya Lila Avinai, which is like the role, the act of being Acharya, still their internal mood is always that I am the das, I am the servant. They never have this ego that I am the guru. This is the mood, das kurinam, that they always have this mood and self-identification of being the servant of the servant of the servant, and then they can work together in perfect harmony. So they serve together like that. Then there's a sweet pastime at Tridhukam Goswami Mars with Prabhuji. Prabhuji tells that when Prabhuji joined the Mat, first he met, he met Srila Gurudev, Bhama Goswami Mars, and Tridhukam Goswami Mars. He saw them first in 1963 or 64 on Navadri Dam when they would go by Champahati, where Prabhuji was born in that village. Then he saw them on Parikrama. At that time he got a rickshaw for them actually because he saw they were wearing naked feet and it was very hot weather and th he thought their feet must be burning. So he got them a rickshaw and took them to the mat. And a short time after that when he was going to school, after school he would go to, actually it said he saw, he met Param Gurudev also, Prabhupada said. Before his Virah Sabha, he went once for a festival and he didn't really directly meet him but he saw and he, he said that these Akadashi burfis we have, every Akadashi now with Prabhupada, Param Gurudev would serve those out on Akadashi there and he said he took this also. People were amazed, like, what kind of burfi is this? It's made from a special kind of root, like a transparent root. When you make the powder and you make it into a burfi, we ate it. And people think, how do you make this? How do you make this? So Param Gurudev would also serve this. It's one kind of root that grows in India. So later on, anyhow, he would go with his school friends. Prudy described this on uh, the disappearance day of Srila Vama Goswami Mars, how he went and he would start, uh, he met with them and he, his other school friends took them to the Mat, and after he went to the Mat like that, Gurudev started teaching him Bhagavad Gita Slokas, and Prudhi would go back and argue with his father. His father would give one commentary in the Gita Slok, Gurudev would give a different commentary, and then he would go and tell Gurudev's commentary to his father, and his father would get very upset and argue with him. But ultimately, he sided with Gurudev. <laughs> Why? That is the eternal relationship. This other relationship is only temporary and external, but his eternal relationship is with Srila Guru Pad Padma. So he, very soon after that, he left home, and he found out when Gurudev was going back to Mathura because Gurudev would spend three, four months of the year in Devananda Gaudiya Mat and preaching in that area. Five, six, like even in his later age, Gurudev would send all the brahmacharis in Bengal Prachar or Gurudev himself would also go for different festivals. So Gurudev would spend some time here, there and whenever he was there, Prabhuji would go and meet with him every day whenever he was in the Devananda Gaudiya Mat. So he found out when Gurudev was going back to Mathura and he followed him there. He came in the train and Gurudev took him there. And Gurudev said, no, it's very hot there. There's no good water there, there's no fans, there's no rice to eat. You're Bengali, how will you eat rotis? Also, we have to beg every day. But pretty thought, these are only external things. Where's our eternal relationship, a mamata? Then we cannot leave that person even for a moment. All the external obstacles are only obstacles for people who are, don't have this pure loving mamata and relationship. For them, it's, there's no obstacle in external facility. So Puruji came, but later on, his family complained so much and they end, somehow they found out and they complained so much that one time 
Gurudev was bringing him back. This is the story that he, they were threatening the Mahat and making a big disturbance for the Mahat. So one time, Gurudev tells this when he was in Paruji's house in 2002. He describes this. So one time I brought him back and he brought him towards the village. He tricked Prabhuji. He said, Prabhuji, oh, we're going to a program in this area. We have to do some big festival, some program. Come with me. And Prabhuji hadn't gone to Navadri with Gurudev before after that time. Since he joined Mathura, he was always serving in Mathura. But Gurudev said, no, 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 come with me and we'll do some program there. So he was thinking, why is he taking me? So he took him that, near that village and he started seeing all the village was like out and ready to meet him. And he was like, oh no, he's brought me back home. So he became very afraid. And then they brought him out and like handed him over to the family. Okay. So then it said that Brody was holding Gurudev's umbrella when they were walking in the sun. So he was holding his umbrella. And when Gurudev gave him to the family, then Gurudev went back towards the train. Gurudev said the same thing like we see with, um, in Gurudev's own life, that his family, when he was in Devgar, when Bhama Goswami Maharaj was sick at that time, Sajjang, Sevak, then Gurudev was going back and forth to collect supplies for him for the temple for maintenance and one time his cousin found him there and he was innocent told him where they were staying and then the whole family came and surrounded them and forced Gurudev to go back and Gurudev stayed again for a few months back home but then later on he ran away again so Gurudev told Prabhuji like don't worry now ease the situation go back for a little short time and then again you'll come back but Prabhuji's mood was that it said Brahmacharya should never return to their homes especially after taking Brahmacharya for 10 years or more you should never touch foot in your home and Prabhuji didn't want to go home ever so, he was, so they brought him, and then he had Gurudev's umbrella. So he told his family, oh, Maharaj forgot his umbrella. Let me just run back and give him the umbrella, and then I'll come back. Gurudev had walked off a few hundred meters. He was saying, like, he spent five, four or five minutes with them, you know, ex- externally showing, oh, yes, I'm back. It's so nice to see you. But just as a ruse, as a trick. And they said, oh, he left his umbrella. I have to go give his umbrella back. So at that point, it's a, he ran and handed the umbrella to Gurudev and then ran off into the jungle. He said he ran through the jungle for a long time. He went on the train tracks in like a direction they wouldn't expect. Went a long way. And then, like it said, 10, 15 kilometers distance, he caught a train. Because he knew that if I go to a local station, they'll catch me there. So he ran through the jungle to another train station. And he caught the train there. And then from there, he knew if I go back to Mathura, or if I go to Devananda Godimat, they'll catch me there. So he went to the Trivakam Goswami Marsh's temple in Chunchura. I said, we'll just stop with this story, even though there's many sweet stories forward, we'll stop with this story. Um, <clears throat> this clock's actually fast. So, um, Shrivakam Goswami Maharaj was there, and he said he lived very austerely at that point. Shrivakam Goswami Maharaj was like secretary of the whole of Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti, and there were many temples throughout India. But even though he was in a big position, he said he would not spend one rupee on his, himself, or he would not, also not on himself, but he would not waste one rupee in maintaining the mat. Prabhupada describes this from his time when he was there, as still a young boy. He said, Trivikram Goswami Maharaj, every day he would go by bicycle to the different nearby uh, cities to do bhiksha. And he said in the morning time, he wouldn't make a big breakfast feast, because you have a big breakfast feast, then it takes two, three hours to cook, and then everyone eats a big feast, and then they get lazy and tired again, eating too much. So he said they would only take leftover to parties, from the night before, or if they had some extra rice from the day before, they would soak it and make what's called panta, soak it in water and take that in the morning. And they wouldn't make any fresh breakfast. They would make a little bit just for takoji. And then most of the brahmacharis wouldn't take any breakfast. So Trivikram Goswami would then go by bike, and he would go collect, and he wouldn't come back till like 3 p.m. It's described. He would come generally back at like 2.30, 3 p.m. He said every day he would ride like 80, 90 kilometers by bicycle. Back, for 20 kilometers this way, 10 kilometers in the city, then back. He was very, like, fit and active. And on the way, he would never eat anything. He, was, he would not take anything. Oh, if something comes on Bhiksha, then how can we eat that? That's for Takaji. That's for Krishna. How can I take it? How can I take his boga? So he would bring that back. And then when he would come back, Prabhupada describes it. First, when he would come back, he would have bags full of all the different things that he collected, like potatoes, rice, dal, all these things. And he would also distribute books and patrikas. We see Param Gurudev would served like that. In the time of Prabhupada, all the brahmacharis would go out on bhiksha. They said they wouldn't go on bhiksha to collect money. The purpose wasn't collecting a lot of money. The purpose was that we can distribute the patrikas, the magazines or the newspapers of the Gaudiya Mat, which is the message of Vaikuntha, because Pakistan Prabhupada said, we are only the messengers of the divine message of Vaikuntha. We are the peons or the postmen who distribute this message of the spiritual world. 
So they would go everywhere mostly to do this. And then they would collect like one paisa from everyone because if, when people give a little donation, then by giving that donation, it builds quick sukriti because that donation, if it goes for Krishna's service directly, then it will create a change in the hearts of the people. So that's why people give d- donations and that's why the Gaudiya devotees would collect these. But they would not collect a big donation from one person. They would collect one paisa from everyone. Prabhupada would say, if you collect a lot from one person, you'll become greedy and again and again you'll go to that person. And then you won't think, I need to go to everywhere else. Oh, and what, well, from one person I got a hundred rupees, then I don't need to go to a thousand people to collect one paisa from everyone. So they would only collect a little bit. Tripakam Goswami was just like that. He would collect a little bit from everyone and then he would come back. And when he came back, it said that... Uh, <clears throat> First, when he come, came back, it said that Prabhupada describes that he was so sweet that his ashram was like the ashram of Agastyamuni. Agastyamuni's ashram, tigers and deer and rabbits and squirrels, everyone lived happily together without any sense of enmity. Because of his own mood of love, all the, normally ferocious animals also had love for one another. And they were completely nourished by Agastya, so they didn't have to fight with one another, eat one another. So it said, Shri Kam Goswami Maharaj's ashram was like that. In his ashram, squirrels, mongoose, cats, dogs, mice, birds. Everyone lived normal, happily together. The cats weren't trying to eat the birds and fight and attack the birds or the squirrels. Everyone was living peacefully together. And when he would come back, they would take prasad first from him. Instead of immediately going and serving the brahmacharis, everyone was hungry, waiting for lunch. But first he would bring out his bags and he would say, oh, then the mongoose would come and he would give them some sweets. Then the birds, he would give them some like grains or seeds or sweets. And they would all wait in lines one after another and be very peacefully, like sitting in line. Okay, this is their turn. And they would know, this is my turn, and the other person's turn, and this group's turn. And Prabhupada would feed them all. Uh, Trivikam Goswami would all feed them what they would like. Like he would give some milk, milk to the cats and kittens, you know, according to their own liking. They said that they, so Prabhupada described that scene. He said how, how sweet was his nature, even though externally sometimes he appeared strong and harsh. His heart was only full of like this love. That's why it said, Vajrada pi kathorani mrinna kusmadapi. That was the nature of the acharya, the pure devotee. Vajrada pi kathorani. They may appear strong as a thunderbolt, but at the same time, they are soft as a rose petal. Mrinna kusmadapi. And in his sloka glorifying Sri Sri Goswami Maharaj, Burdi also used these words Vajrada pi kathorani mrinna kusmadapi. He was very, sometimes very strong and hard. If anyone is doing anything against bhakti, against Guru Seva, then he would be strong as a thunderbolt. But if anyone is trying to serve with sincerity, then he would be very soft and affectionate, like a rose petal. So he said, Purdy said, then what else would he do? He would teach Harikata. When he would give Harikata, he would teach slokas. And until the brahmacharis learned the slokas and could stand up and recite the slokas and repeat purports of the slokas, then he would not move on. And if it took one week, two weeks in one class, and the one subject, he would again and again repeat the subject, and he would say, now your turn. You stand up. What did you hear? And they would have to repeat the sloka, repeat the purport, until he was satisfied. And if someone didn't come for class one day, he would make fun of them, he would tease them, and he said, okay, they would make them stand up in the whole class. And then he would make sure that everyone had to learn everything, even the ladies, they were learning all the slokas, everything, and then he would go forward in his classes. And so Prabhupada learned many verses from him then. Like, Tathodhu Sangha Utsarija Santu Sajetsu Buddhiman Santai Vaisa Chindanti Mane Vyasa Muktibi that the nature of the sadhu is that they will speak words like a sharp sword that will cut through our material attachments of the mind. And you should give up all bad association. Tato du sangha Give up all bad association and take shelter to the sadhus and accept their chastisement, accept their teachings, even if it feels like cutting of a sword. They will cut through all your anartas and then you'll become pure and clean. So he learned many slogans at that time. He also said, how would he cook? He wouldn't waste a single rupee. He said that uh, when they would cook, then he, he would use only one match. If one match didn't work, then he would say, sometimes he wouldn't even use a match. He would borrow from the villager's fire, like next neighbor's fire. He said, okay, we need something to light our fire. They would take a, like a straw or a stick of wood or something and bring the fire and start their fire. He wouldn't even wait one match. If he had to use one match, then they would use one match. But if that match didn't work until they started it somewhere else, he wouldn't let them use another match. And how would they, what would they use for firewood? Wood is very expensive before and also now. Every few months we're spending like five, six lakhs rupees on wood like $10,000 on wood, cooking for so many people. It's not cheap. So he wouldn't buy wood like this. They would, in the, when the trees would shed their leaves in the autumn, they would collect all these leaves in many bags and dry them. And when, when they were dry anyhow, and they would use these leaves, like most of their cooking was done with these leaves or some kind of straw or any like bhiksha they could do collecting wood. Like Krishna and Baladev went out for Sandipani Muni. They collected wood from the forest. 
like that. So they would collect wood like this, anything they could find. Otherwise, they would just use dry leaves and they would use that. And said when they would cook the rice, the Sevak also said this, Puri Maharaj. He said when he would cook rice, they would cook it till at least 80% like 80 done. And they would have the pot very tightly closed. And then they would take it off the fire to save the fire fuel. And then the rice would finish cooking only by the heat that it had taken from the fire already. He wouldn't even waste that much. So what to speak of not spending anything on himself? He wouldn't waste anything of Guru Vaishnava's property. He said that he would fix his own watches. He wouldn't send watches to repair anywhere else. He would fix sew cloth. He wouldn't send, waste money on tailors. He would do everything himself with the own devotees. So Puruji stayed there. From there, then after some time, he again went to Mathura. And then from that time, when his family would try to come and take him back, he would never even speak with them. He was very strict. He would never even speak with them or look at them. And he never went back there to his home. Never. In his whole life. Since so many years. Since like 45 years. So there are many beautiful glories of Tribhukam Goswami Maharaj. We'll hear more tonight. Maybe this afternoon. Hopefully we'll hear from Prabhuji tonight. If he gives us his mercy and sees our enthusiasm in our programs. And there are many sweet pastimes of Srila Gurudev with Tribhukam Goswami Maharaj and Brajamandal Prikama that we'll hear from the Vaishnavas. Many wonderful sweet pastimes. This is just touching like a small glimmer of his glories. He wrote many wonderful articles that were published in Rays of the Harmonist before published in the Gaudiya Patrika, Bhagavad Patrika. And his Harigata was very amazing, very powerful Harigata, life changing Harigata. So we'll hear more about that tonight. Adiós.